The Harry Potter films are some of the most beloved of a generation. Full of magic, compelling characters, and real stakes, many people grew up watching Harry, Ron, and Hermione grow up. With eight movies, you bet, there's a whole bunch of secrets lurking behind the scenes. From fun trivia to on-set hijinks, we're going to cover it all. Let's get started. Long, long. You're a wizard, Harry. For our first entry, we wanted to inform you about the director who almost launched the Harry Potter franchise. We all know that Chris Columbus was the man responsible for the first two movies, but did you know he wasn't Warner Brothers' first choice? One of those directors who was approached and was keen to work on the first film before Columbus was Steven Spielberg, and he was pretty down for working on the movie too. Having fleshed out some concepts and designs and even toyed with making it animated, but he knew Potter was going to be a hit and wanted to be challenged, which led to him dropping out to finish his friends, the late Stanley Kubrick's AI, instead. Here's a weird bit of trivia that you totally didn't consider for the franchise. Now that you'll know it though, you'll be saying to yourself, why of course they had to do that. The early Potter films were dominated by child actors, and Daniel Radcliffe revealed that in those early movies, all of the kids had to get molds of their teeth made. This was in case any of them lost a tooth by accident or had a baby tooth fall out. They could put the mold into the kid's mouth and no one would be any wiser. The question now is, did any of the child actors actually have to use a prosthetic tooth while on set? We need answers. Just because many of the adult actors are acclaimed and respected individuals doesn't mean they all get along. Case in point, there was some tension between Helena Bonham Carter and Emma Thompson, who played Bellatrix and Trelawney respectively. The reason for this dates back to the 90s, when Thompson and Potter director Kenneth Branagh were an item. They divorced after Branagh and Carter's affair became public, but thankfully, both actors are highly professional, and any animosity didn't spill into the set, with Thompson even citing the two actually made peace with the whole debacle. While that's some immense points for both ladies for keeping it so professional at work, we're not sure we'd be able to follow their example in a similar situation. This little nugget of information works as both something fun for you to know, but also as a hats off salute towards the prop department. There are an insane level of handcrafted items used for the Harry Potter movies, most of them you don't even realize. For the entire series, Daniel Radcliffe used 160 pairs of prop glasses while also using around 65 different wands. They built 17,000 wand boxes for Ollivander's shop, each hand-labeled, and each of the memory vials for Dumbledore's pensive were handwritten. They used 14 Ford Angelicas for the second movie, and 250 body casts for various scenes, including petrification and grimly demises. Talk about going above and beyond. While J.K. Rowling was not a writer for the Harry Potter films, she would go on to write the Fantastic Beast films, she did overrule some decisions the script made. Being the creator of the property, we can see why Rowling would be a little overprotective of some character beats. One such moment was the duel between Snape and McGonagall in the eighth movie. Originally, it was supposed to be Harry dueling with the former potions master. Due to the whole connection between Snape and Lily, it could have been quite moving, but Rowling was adamant it would be McGonagall. Rowling believed that she needed a moment to shine and get more active with the plot, vetoing Harry out of the duel. Do you agree with Rowling on that one? Let us know. Did it bug you like it bugged us that Crab suddenly vanished from the franchise in the later movies? Jamie Waylett was in every single Harry Potter film as Vincent Crab up until the sixth entry Half-Blood Prince, but during Deathly Hollows, he was not asked to come back, and the character of Crab was replaced with Blaze. Blaze is in the books, but was not one of Malfoy's goons, meaning he wasn't in the room of requirements when it burned. Jamie Waylett did not get to cap off his return to Hogwarts due to his arrest in 2009 for growing illegal substances. The actor would be arrested again in 2011 for looting during the London riots. The casting for the core three students at Hogwarts are on point. Daniel Radcliffe is Harry Potter, just as Rupert Grint is Ron, and Emma Watson is Hermione. But we almost got someone else playing Hermione instead. In order to find a brand new unknown to help carry these Potter movies, the casting department went to countless schools auditioning students. When they came to Emma's school, she actually avoided auditioning, despite everyone else participating. She simply wasn't interested in the idea of auditioning for the role and possibly acting as a result of it. Her teacher convinced her otherwise, and Emma would be the final audition at her school. So thank you, Emma Watson's teacher, for your contribution to the Potter films. We're certain you heard about the rather adult and intimate Easter egg found in the end credits of Prisoner of Azkaban. 
As the credits roll, footprints move around the Marauder's map, and if you keep your eyes open, you'll notice something odd. Two students are seen to be facing each other, with one set of legs open and the other pair between. This position led many to believe that this was two students hooking up, but Russ Weatherell, the man who designed the credits, put that to rest. He said that, in his mind, that's just two students sharing a hug, and it's not supposed to be anything raunchier than that. That being said, director Alfonso Cuaron loved the moment when he spotted it and decided to leave it in for the adults. It's amazing what filmmakers can do with CGI these days. So many digital effects go unnoticed as they blend seamlessly into the movie. While this is the case now, it was not the case when the Potter films were just starting. This proved to be a bit of a challenge when it came to the owls having to deliver mail to the wizarding community, but they weren't going to let that slow them down. The crew working on the Harry Potter movies actually trained owls to deliver mail, much like we used to train ravens to do the same just for the movie. On top of that, the letters that the owls had to carry were handwritten, not typed out on a computer. Aside from his glasses, messy black hair, and lightning bolt scar, the biggest defining feature Harry has are his eyes. People are constantly telling him they look just like those of his mother's. In the books, everyone makes a point to say that Harry's eyes are green, just like Lily's, and the filmmakers did try to bring this aspect of the book to life. Only Daniel Radcliffe proved to be allergic to the contacts, so Chris Columbus opted to keep Radcliffe's blue eyes. Thankfully, Lily Potter actor Geraldine Somerville also has blues, ensuring there was some continuity between the two characters on screen. Things would have been really awkward if one had blue and one had green eyes. The first Harry Potter film used the Duke Humphreys Library to portray the restricted section. In case you are wondering where that is, it's the oldest reading room in the Bodleian Library at the University of Oxford. The Bodleian was established in 1602, meaning that the treasures inside it are exceptionally old. With this in mind, open flames, especially in the hands of a child, are a huge red flag for the staff. But despite this, the library allowed for the production of Harry Potter to take place in the library as well as allowing an open flame within its walls. This would be the first time a flame would be allowed inside the library in centuries. Thankfully, no books or scrolls got damaged due to the lamp. You know how we talked about Geraldine Somerville being cast in the role of Lily Potter throughout the series? But despite this, she actually wasn't the first person considered to play Lily. So wanna take a guess at who was originally approached to play Lily? We'll give you a hint. She's the creator of the character. Well, she's the creator of all the characters. That's right, J.K. Rowling was originally asked to portray Lily Potter, which would have been fun as Rowling created Potter. Ultimately, Rowling opted not to do the cameo, perhaps due to it being too on the nose and would break the illusion. You have to admit though, Rowling could totally pass as Lily Potter. Now onto a slightly grimmer entry, but one to still bear in mind. Being a child actor isn't easy to begin with, but being cast in one of the most celebrated franchises of all time is going to put pressure on anyone. That's what happened to Daniel Radcliffe. He was thrust into the spotlight at such a young age that things started to get to him a few movies in. Whenever Radcliffe slipped a toe out of line or did anything considered to be too grown up, the tabloids went nuts, which caused the teenager to sometimes show up to set with a few drinks in him. We don't know how bad it was, but thankfully, it never got to the point where they asked him to leave the role. You know what's awesome about Helena Bottom Carter? The fact that she goes all out for a role and utterly becomes the character she's playing, no matter who the character is. When it came time to portray Bellatrix Lestrange, she did not hold back. But perhaps she should have, at least a bit for the sake of Matthew Lewis, better known as Neville Longbottom. In the fifth movie, when she's threatening Neville, she accidentally pierced his inner ear with her wand. She decided to brandish the wand a certain way, but when Lewis shifted, the wand went totally up his ear. Ugh, talk about major pain. He only told her how much it hurt days after the incident, possibly due to how intimidating Bellatrix can be. So what happened to Madame Hooch? She was Harry's flying instructor in the first movie and also doubled as a referee for the Quidditch match between Gryffindor and Slytherin. Unlike the movies, the character appears in the rest of the book series. When it came time for the film adaptations, however, things were a little different. Warner knew that they'd have to play Hooch actress Zoe Wanamaker more for the second movie and decided that she didn't have too much bearing on the overall plot. So they decided to save some money by simply removing her from the narrative altogether, despite her appearances in the book. Did you miss Madame Hooch in subsequent movies or did you not even notice? Let us know in the comments. You know how we spoke highly of the props department going above and beyond with the sets? They handmade countless items just to bring certain locations to life. Well, this one piece of set design takes the cake. 
literally in the first movie after Dumbledore has given his speech a declaration of letting the feast begin allows for countless amounts of food to magically appear what could have easily been prop food Chris Columbus insisted that all the food shown in the Great Hall actually be real food only due to the hot lighting and multiple takes the food would actually spoil and start to smell subsequent food in future movies would be frozen or be mold props while many of the young actors likely didn't have a clue about just how big the films were going to be, the same can't be said about the veterans. Knowing that, it's no surprise that some of them wanted to keep a few souvenirs from the set, and by keep, we mean steal. Coming from an interview with Jason Isaacs, he stated that Alan Rickman was an absolute pro at stealing props off the set. While having no scenes on this particular set, Rickman stole a slew of coins from the Gringotts vault. This inspired Isaacs to start stealing props, which started with a copy of The Daily Prophet. The problem is, he got busted by a set worker, who said director David Yates wanted the prop back. Oops. Speaking of Alan Rickman, let's tell a funny story about the potions master while he was on set. Being an accomplished actor, Rickman had a nice car at the time of filming The Order of the Phoenix, a BMW to be exact. But before this upgrade, he had a different car, and Matthew Lewis and Rupert Grint found themselves in this car. They spilled a milkshake in this car. When he brought his new BMW to work, he forbade the duo from coming within 5 meters of his new car. We can only imagine the inner Severus Snape coming out to terrorize the boys when he put this word into unspoken law. It seems like no milkshakes were spilled in the new BMW either. Improvised lines are always fun because the actors had to think of them on the spot and be memorable to trump whatever was in the script. This goes double for child actors, who may not be as well trained or accomplished as some of the veterans out there. Tom Felton proved any naysayers wrong during the Chamber of Secrets, however. In the movie, Harry used Polyjuice Potion to disguise himself as Goyle. Harry states that he read something and Felton saw this as the perfect segue to add his own line, commenting that he didn't know Goyle could read. That brutal and hilarious line was of Felton's own creation and is one of the best lines in the franchise, if you ask us. Kenneth Branagh was brought in to play Gilderoy Lockhart in the second movie, but did you know he wasn't the studio's first pick? Don't get us wrong though, we think Branagh nailed the role, which is why it's surprising to know that the studio wanted these actors initially. So, who was initially supposed to play the ditzy dark arts teacher? That was actually going to be Hugh Grant. He was cast in the role but had to drop out due to scheduling conflicts. Another contender before Branagh was actually the future Dumbledore, Jude Law, but at the time he thought to be too young looking to play a Hogwarts person. Professor. We wonder if that consideration helped with his casting in Fantastic Beasts. In the first two Harry Potter films, the students wore their Hogwarts robes year-round, but this changed when Alfonso Cuaron was hired. If you're anything like us, this likely irked you so much, but there is a method for the madness, according to the director. Considering things get a little darker in The Prisoner of Azkaban, and the themes get a bit heavier, Cuaron wanted the kids to wear clothes to reflect their personality. When it came time to wear the uniforms as well, he told the students to modify them a bit. That's why some students look prim and proper, and others have shirts untucked and ties are loose. We get the uniform bit, but are still uncertain about the casual wear at Hogwarts. Aside from chicken pox, do you remember what the biggest fear was at your primary school? If lice didn't come to mind right away, you had it too easy growing up. And while Hogwarts was a film set and not a real school, it still had the same problems due to that amount of kids in a confined space. During Chamber of Secrets, a lice breakout happened and hit many of the kids and even some of the adults. The lice scenario was so widespread that production actually had to stop in order to verify everyone working and terminate the parasites. As to how the lice breakout happened remains a mystery, but there are dozens of possibilities on set of a Harry Potter movie. While he didn't have too much to do with the character the more the series progressed, Dudley still showed up to torment Harry in the opening of a few movies, but he almost lost the role completely much earlier on in the cycle of movies. Actor Harry Melling lost a considerable amount of weight between the production of Chamber of Secrets and Prisoner of Azkaban, and he no longer fit the description of Dudley. Instead of cutting him out or giving the role to someone else, they got Melling to wear a fat suit for subsequent movies. Unlike the books, Dudley would have less impact on the opening of the narratives as the movies went on, which is a shame due to how they end up in the books. Want some proof that the trio of actors hired to play Harry, Ron, and Hermione were perfect for their respective roles? 
Look no further than this little bit of awesome trivia. While working on The Prisoner of Azkaban, Alfonso Cuaron asked each of the three actors to write an essay on their characters to understand them better. What happened next was a true reflection of the characters they were hired to play. Emma Watson wrote a 16-page essay on Hermione. Daniel Radcliffe turned in a one-page analysis of who Harry Potter is, while Rupert Grint didn't even do it, stating that Ron would have likely not done it either, which explains why he's always copying homework in the books. Sometimes doing nothing is the right thing indeed. When one thinks of the Harry Potter books, there's only one word that should come to mind after magic. British. Apparently, Warner Bros. got that memo late, as they were considering an American cast early on in pre-production. One of the studio's favorites was the late Robin Williams in the role of Hagrid. Chris Columbus was also considering Liam Aiken for the role of Harry Potter, but J.K. Rowling stepped in and intervened, stating that the cast must be British to reflect the book. She won on this one, and the entire cast would end up being British, with one exception, that of the late Vern Troyer, who played the goblin Griphook in the first movie, but was dubbed in post-production by Warwick Davis. So those are all the cool little details from behind the scenes of the Harry Potter films. Which tidbit of trivia did you think was particularly cool and what did you already know? What's your favorite Harry Potter movie? And would you like to see a film adaptation of The Cursed Child? Let us know in the comments below and be sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for more videos like this in your playlist. Thanks for watching.